It is my honor to introduce to us our professor, our pastor, our teacher, Pastor Christian. Stand up on your feet, Charisma. Those of you who are watching online, send your emoji hearts right now. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Wow. Okay. Still morning. Good morning, Charisma. Good morning. Amen. <clears throat> well, it's wonderful to see all of you here, and it seems like every year on Pentecost Sunday, it's my turn to preach. <laughs> uh, the de facto Holy Spirit man, I guess. <laughs> but there was a lot of pressure on me because by gifting, I'm a pastor teacher. Teaching is a very strong gift of mine. But so when I received, you know, he just told me like last month, I said, oh, you're going to preach on, on Pentecost Sunday. And I thought, I don't want to give another teaching on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not meant to be studied. He's meant to be experienced, right? Yeah. So today I would like, I've been praying the whole week and say, God, give me the honor to lead your people to experience a deeper level of Holy Spirit experience. Wow. Amen. Amen. Because I was privileged when I came to know the Lord in the uh, early 80s, sounds like a long time ago, the Spirit of God was moving powerfully. When I go to church, I love to go to church. Uh, <clears throat> I was born into the Assemblies of God Church, <clears throat> and that was the only church I knew back then. And that was the only denomination that believed in the working of the Holy Spirit. So if I go out of town and I visit any Assemblies of God Church, it will be the same. It doesn't matter who preaches. It doesn't matter who song led. The powerful presence of the Spirit is there, right? And charisma is getting to that level. So today, I, I want, at the end of the service, that you experience the Holy Spirit, not just to know in your head more about the Holy Spirit, but to experience Him in a deeper way. But before that, I, I have a message that is burning in my heart. It's not related to the Holy Spirit, but it's important nonetheless. Okay, <clears throat> and that is, the importance of the local church. Charisma is one of the many local churches. It's not the only many, but we are nonetheless the local church, and it is very important to be connected to the local church. Now, church is not a place you go every Sunday. Okay, did you hear what I say? Church is not a place you go every Sunday. It is a place where you belong. It's a family, amen? Okay, now, I'm going to share with you a verse. It's a pretty loaded verse. In one verse, one sentence, there are many, many pictures, many settings, many people, and they are seemingly unrelated, right? Okay, next. <clears throat> and it is somewhere obscurely hidden in Psalm 68, verse 6. And God showed me this revelation years ago, and I have the passion uh, <clears throat> for the Bible study that I led, the Foundation Bible study, I have the fourth and the final class of all the topics I chose the local church because I really believe in that. Now it says, God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in parched land. And that is the New, uh, the new American Standard Bible. I read in a different translation in NIV, he said, God sets the lonely in family. So it's a home, it's a family, and that's what the church is all about. He leads forth prisoners <clears throat> with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land or a dry land. So in one verse, one sentence, you have God on one hand, and there are three groups of people seemingly very radical and unrelated, and three settings. And that firstly, you have the family or the home, and then the second group, uh, prisoners. Like, how does prison compare with families? And then the third one is the de uh, rebels and desert. Like, th those are imagery where there is no connection. How, how do you connect the desert, the family, and the prison? Rebels, you know. Uh, so, but it's all connected in the local church. Well, it is God's idea. God is doing something. Number one, 
he makes or he sets. You know, like how ladies, you prepare for guests, for dinner or a special occasion, you set the table, right? You put the pieces where they should be, not haphazardly, but there is a pattern. So God sets, and then he leads. That's what God is trying to do. God, it's God's idea. So first of all, he said he makes home for the lonely. Lonely or lonely people or some translators say homeless. Everybody say homeless. homeless. Now, obviously you are not homeless. Everybody has a home. But homeless are, spiritually speaking, there are a lot of homeless people. Spirit. Now, this is all talking about the spiritual. That's all comes together in the spirit realm. So God sets those people who are without a home, without a family. They are all by yourself, the solidarity. So, so he sets them in family. So that's why the church is a family. It's not a place you go on Sunday. It's a home. Now, all of us, I think, have a place to live, right? Have a roof over us. Having a, a, a place to live doesn't make it to be a home, right? Many people have a, a house to stay, but not necessarily a home. So the church is a home. Not only the place to stay, but it's, it's a family relationship. And God obviously is the father. Before he can be a father, he has to have children. So God is the one who sets. God initiates. Now, those of you who are visiting Charisma, if you don't have a home church, you don't have a family, we would like to welcome you to extend the hand of fellowship that you will adopt us to be part of your family. Amen? <laughs> now, <clears throat> for whatever reason you don't like Charisma, that's okay too. But make sure you find a church where you belong, really. I, I, you know, Pastor James is just like me. We don't have any problems that you don't like Christmas for whatever reason. That, that's okay. We are not the only church in town. Right? There are many. But make sure you find one that you call family. Don't be a, a perennial. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Don't be a, a perennial or a forever visitors to a church. That's not good, right? You don't want to just keep on visiting churches. You need to have a home to belong. Otherwise, the Bible says you are homeless. You, you are a lonely and when you're alone, it's an easy target for the devil, right? That's how Eve got into trouble, right? She was all by herself, and the, you know, the devil just tempted her. Now, it makes a home for the lonely, and then he leads out prisoners into prosperity or with singing. Not on prisoners and home, how does that connect? Well, do you realize that in the church, there are a lot of prisoners, quote-unquote? Not physically, but emotionally. There are a lot of people with all kinds of baggage, right? The prisoner of their own fear, of their own insecurities, of hatred, of anger, of so many issues. They are just trapped within them. I know this. God is the one who's going to lead you out. Leading is a process. It doesn't happen overnight, right? God leads you into prosperity. Right now, you're living a miserable life that you are <clears throat> uh, yeah, or tormented. God wants to lead you to experience prosperity. It happens in the context of a family where you establish trust. You can trust the leadership. You can trust someone to help you out. I can guarantee you, you don't have to spend a lot of money counseling and so on. Although sometimes it's necessary, but in the church, it can happen. It happened so many times in my 30, 40 years of <clears throat> pastoral experience. So prisoners, there are a lot of prisoners who, who are bound in whatever issues in their life. And they need to be set free <clears throat> in the context of a church, in a family. However, said, but only the rebellious, the rebels. Now, who are these rebels? Like, again, it's very different, right? Families, prisoners, and rebels. Who are the rebels? Well, God, if you have accepted Jesus, you will be led by God. God is setting you in a family. So it's your task to find which church it is or which family. God doesn't force you. You don't like a church, he doesn't force you. But if you don't, and you said, you know that God has set you in charisma, you just say, oh no, because of conflicts or you don't like certain people, well, guess what? You become rebellious. You become the rebel. And what way do you end up? In a dry land where life becomes very unfruitful. If you read the Message Bible, which happens to be Pastor James' favorite, it says, you will rot in hell. No, literally. I didn't put it, it says, rot in hell. Now, that's very serious, right? Not literally, but, but your life will be very miserable. You'll be unfruitful. So that's why in the church, where the Bible says, iron sharpens iron, a man sharpens the countenance of another. So it is in the context of a family that this can be done. Because in your family, I'm sure your family feud, right? Sometimes you argue, even with your parents or with your siblings. 
But at the end of the day, they are still your brother, they are still your mother, your father, right? You don't quit and say, I don't want to be called your, your, your brother anymore or your sister. You, you, you have no choice. Who our brother or sisters are, right? You have no choice. You were born into that family. So that's why in the church, we never say we are friends in Christ. Never, right? Bill, you are my friend in Christ. You are my brother in Christ, correct? Nobody else says you are my friend in Christ. Why? Because friends, you can choose. Brothers and sisters, you can't. Right? So likewise in the church, there are people, sometimes oddballs, who just rub you in the wrong way. Well, guess what? God placed them here. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. Why? It's to sharpen you. Now, if you happen to leave a church because of conflicts, because of trouble, well, I'm, I'm really sad. Because the problem is not with the church. Not that the church is perfect. But the problem is with you. You will leave the problem with you. So wherever you go, you will encounter the same problem. Maybe in a different form, but it, the root of the problem is the same, right? God wants to show you that you need to get rid of the problem, and it happens in the context, so that you will be let out of prison of yourself, your own secure insecurities and all the issues of your life, so that you will live a pros prosperous life. Amen? Amen? All right, Okay. so much for my promo. Okay, let's go to the... <clears throat> the message today. The Holy Spirit, as I said just now, that He's not meant to be only studied, but to be experienced. So first and foremost, the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes, for me, many of us are not really familiar who the Holy Spirit is. We know the Father because we have an earthly Father we can identify. And then we know Jesus because He's a human being and we read the pages of the Scriptures. But who is the Holy Spirit? I mean, and, and sometimes... In the early days before I knew the Holy Spirit, I'm kind of apprehensive, right? Like, because I grew up in a temple, a Buddhist temple. From time to time, we were bringing mediums. We call them mediums, where the spirit, whatever spirit, <laughs> then later on, I knew that they are evil spirits, but the spirits came upon them, and they become weird. They, you know, they, they, they shake, and they go into a trance and all that. So I thought, wow, maybe the Holy Spirit would do something weird to my life, you know? So, so, uh, so I thought, hmm, I, I'm not really sure. No, I, I want you to be assured that the Holy Spirit... Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, he is the third person of the Holy Spirit. He is God. He is not it. He is not the force. He, he is a person with a personality, right? So, and... Now, did you give you a clue the Holy, basically who the Holy Spirit is? John 14, 16. Now, this is in the context where Jesus is going away. He said, I'm going to prepare a place and I'm going to come back to receive you. And he told his disciples and said, you know the way I'm going. And then Philip being so realistic, he said, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way? And then that's why Jesus 14, 6 famously said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? So that is in the context of Jesus going away, preparing heaven for us, and he's coming back. Now, so in the context, because he's going away, he said, I will give you another uh, counselor, comforter, helper. The word is parakletos, means coming alongside, somebody come alongside to help you, to comfort you, to be your counsellor, like in a defence, a legal defence, your lawyer will come alongside to defend you. And, and that's what it means, right? So another counsellor, another of the same kind. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is exactly like Jesus. So if you read in the scriptures how Jesus behaved, and that's how the Holy Spirit will behave. He said exactly like the same kind. So he's not weird. Now, okay, next slide. I can tell you that the Holy Spirit will not embarrass you, really. Now, the difference between demon possession, where you're de you know, somebody is demonized and controlled by the Holy Spirit, is different because they lose control, and usually the person will act weird and they cry and they scream and roll around uh, and totally being embarrassed. But that's not the Holy Spirit. Now, in the back of your mind, I think you have encountered some people who are very spiritually minded, right? Sometimes they act weird. They speak weird, right? They say every other sentence, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Do you want to eat? Oh, hallelujah. I was like, okay, come on. You know? I mean, they are not, not very practical or they're just strange. I can guarantee you they are strange. They act differently. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. They are strange because it's their personality. Don't blame it on God. Really? <laughs> you know, God gets get blamed a lot of times. It has nothing to do with God. It's their personality. Now, and sometimes they... they, they they stay, say strange things, it's because they have never been taught properly. Now, I'm very weary as a pastor when people come to me and, you know, every other word they say, oh, God told me this, or God told me that. 
And I mean, if they are just you know, new believers, I'll just let them be. But if we are at the level of the leadership, I will correct them. Because my boss, who is a veterinarian and not a Christian leader, wrote and said, oh, God told us this, God told us. I said, I said Dr. So-and-so, with all due respect, Christian leaders don't speak that way. Never. We never say, God told me this and God told me that. Now, instead, I would say, I feel that God is speaking to me. It's only a feeling. It's an impression. I could be wrong. Because if you say, God told you this, if somebody comes to my office and say, God told me this, I say, okay, end of discussion. I cannot discuss with you. You cannot ask me, what do you think, Pastor? I said, whatever it is, when you said, God told me this, you are just saying, Pastor, don't even dare to argue with what I said because God has said, don't you dare challenge God, right? So, so if Pompey said, oh, God told me to marry this woman or marry this girl or marry this guy, I said, okay, you have already made up your mind. Nobody can say anything else, right? I wouldn't dare to challenge that because God has already said that. But the problem is that later they change their mind. Like, when they come to church, they say, oh, God told me the charisma is so wonderful and all that. God told me to be here. And then because of problems, whatever, they come to, you know, maybe Pastor James or myself and say, God told me to move to another church. So I said, what happened back then when you told us God said, God told you? Did God change his mind like this? Like Seattle, this morning it was kind of rainy, gloomy, and now the sunshine. Do you think God will change his mind that way, right? Now, anytime when people come to me, they say they want to ask permission to leave, I said, I will bless you. But please, don't use the name of God. Because you are... You, <laughs> like, Really, God has really, really little to do with this. You know, don't put it on God. So language, right? We have to speak properly. So people are weird. They use God all the time, the Holy Spirit. Not that I don't believe in it, but it's like, come on, you know, use wisdom. Because if you make a mistake that clearly is not God, then how are you going to backtrack? One time, there was this girl, uh, had a problem, broke away, broke up with a, a, a guy, and she wants to leave, cannot stand the guy, came to me. But then... Before that, there was a prophet who came. And she asked the prophet and said, should I stay or should I, st I leave? Because in this context, I knew, I heard. The prophet, for whatever reason, said, stay. So she had to stay, right? Six months later, she asked permission to leave. And I said, you asked for a word from God and the prophet of God. And since then, I told the prophet, he's my mentor, actually. I said, next time when people ask this question, just don't say it. Even though it is from God, don't say it. Because people are using you to hear what they want to hear. So I said, the, you asked for a confirmation. The prophet said, she, he heard God said, you are to stay. Then why are you leaving? You know what she said? But God didn't say how long I'm going to stay, right? Yeah. I said, oh, you are reinterpreting whatever, right? So I was like, why even bother to ask if that's the case? So all this to say that, you know, just... Don't use the name of God simply, you know, for our own benefit. Just say, I feel. Okay, your feeling can be wrong. That's what I do. I, I feel like God is saying this to you. It's an impression. Impression can be wrong. So that way, I don't just blame God. So now, <clears throat> God will not embarrass you. There are times when, you know, when you encounter the Holy Spirit in a strong way, you, 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 yes, a reaction. Different people react differently. Some people will cry uncontrollably. Some people will fall over. And there are times where you laugh, right? There's the holy laughter moment. Or you begin to shake and all that. And that's okay. That's okay. But that doesn't become your SOP. You know what SOP is? Those of you who work in, what is SOP? Standard operating procedure. Will you think that just because the first time the Holy Spirit encountered you this way, it has to be a way. In fact, let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit deals with us, He is not interested in formula. We, especially engineers, right, we like formulas. We want to create something and say, because God moved in this way, He has to continue on. No, He doesn't. He doesn't, right? So if you cry, like there was a girl who came to our church because her church didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. She came to our church powerfully touched. She was crying a lot to the point that she embarrassed herself. And then she stopped coming to church. So we asked and said, now, why don't you want to come to church? She said, oh, Pastor, I'm afraid to come to church. I said, why? Oh, because I cry a lot and I embarrass myself. I said, who told you to cry? Right? You don't have to cry. It doesn't mean that Holy Spirit touches you every time you have to cry. If it is cry, it is you who is crying. Not the Holy Spirit forces you to cry. There was another guy that, that because he had a, 
evil spirit, he shook violently the first time, and then demon was cast out of it. So every time he came and he felt that God touched him, he began to shake, right? And then he became very distracting. People look at him and get weird and move away from him. You know? So one time I tapped him on the back and said, hey, Daniel, his name was Daniel, stop shaking. He said, oh, I bet I'm quenching the Holy Spirit if I stop shaking. No, 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 no. This is not the work of the Holy Spirit. The first time, maybe. But now, the Holy Spirit doesn't cause you to shake. Okay, this is what the Bible says. Wait, no, no. <laughs> For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if you are fearful, that's not God. But of power, of love, and of sound mind. Oh, you don't check your brains out when you come into the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. You, this is not demon possession. <laughs> you still have your brains. You can use your mind. So if you have any spiritual gifts... You can stop whenever you want. You can start whenever you want. He will not re release you to be uncontrollable. That's not the Holy Spirit. Discipline. Sound mind means discipline. He is a discipline, right? No, no, no chaos. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So it is in the context of exercising spiritual gifts. You may have a, a message from God. How you want to deliver it, when you want to deliver it, or if you want to deliver it, or not, it's all under your control. You never lose control. So that's why the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, right? He will not force his way in. So, so be well assured, the Holy Spirit will not make you weird. If you're weird, maybe you are being weird. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. No, seriously. So we see a lot of weird things happening in the church. It's the flesh. Like there are churches like of animal sound coming out or holy laughter or rolling and all that. Well, the Holy Spirit might trigger that, but it, it, He didn't cause all this. It's the human, excessive human reaction to that. So if you don't want to cry, you don't, it's okay. The Holy Spirit can handle it, right? It's not like, oh, I'm so grieved that you don't cry. No, no, you can cry. It's okay to cry, but you don't have to cry. So don't blame the Holy Spirit just because, oh, the Holy Spirit told me to do something. No, He will not embarrass you in any way, shape, or form, okay? Next slide, please. Now, today I want to, tell about two things. I have a lot of things to tell, but only have time for two. Guide. Now, Holy Spirit will guide you. The Bible says, however, when he, Jesus, right, said, the spirit of truth has come, so he will guide you into all truth. And the Holy Spirit wants to guide you into truth. So that means that if he, if he, he would allow him to guide you, not only once in a while, but every day, you will be less prone to make errors. Isn't that great, right? We make so many dumb mistakes, so many blunders in our lives. If we just care to ask the Holy Spirit, can you just lead me? Can you tell me? And He will, right? Lead you into all truth. So you'll be less error prone and you will not get into errors if you allow Him. Isn't that wonderful? And that's very practical, right? So even in your job, there is no such thing to the, to, to the Holy Spirit, something secular and something spiritual. Everything is spiritual to Him, right? We are said, we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. So your worship is not only just in church. The place that you work is also a place of worship too. So he wants to guide you in all this. Next one. In the guiding, in Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 20, he said, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, follow it whether it turns to the right or to the left. Now, you don't literally hear an audible voice, although sometimes you might, but that voice can be the scriptures. When you read, it will speak to you or to somebody else. So somehow God will speak to you if you were to be careful to listen. Now, my wife is a lot more sensitive to this voice and she heard twice in her life, audible voice or life-threatening situation. When she, in her younger days, she was in a swimming pool and she was drowning and the lifeguard didn't know that she was drowning because they were playing and all that. And, and she, she was drowning. And then her voice told her and said, cry out to the lifeguard, which she did. And the lifeguard rescued her. And then the second time was just uh, maybe 10 years ago, who she was driving uh, along 520, where somehow she skidded and she, she hit a, against the curb. So instead of applying the brakes, she stepped on, on the gasoline. So she hit full force one way and then it flipped to, to hit on the other way. And then if it continue, her, her car will flip over. But she heard a voice and said, your, your foot is on the gas pedal, which she looked and straight away she, she released that and that saved her, right? So there are times where God will speak to you audibly, but most times it is through the scriptures or you are praying 
The Bible says the still small voice will whisper in you, but he will speak to you, to direct you, to go, whether you go to the left or to the right, a voice will be direct, directing you. And then the next slide says, not only just once in a while, but is that the Almighty will, te- will teach me what to, do, what to say. So it's not only about you. God wants to use you as an encourager so that I will know how to encourage weary people. There are a lot of people, your colleagues, your friends, people around you, even your own family members, need words of encouragement. God will give you the word to say. So not just to encourage you, but you can be an encourager as well. Now he says, morning by morning, he will wake me to listen to be like a disciple. A disciple is somebody who would listen and do the word of God, right? So morning by morning, God would like to speak to you. But the question is that, are you listening? To listen to a voice, it has to be familiar, right? So we have to learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Right now, if my wife were to call me, I know immediately it's it's her. Why? Because I've listened to that voice many times over. So to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you have to spend time to be in tune to His voice. And sometimes, just like the Bible says, um, Elijah, right? God showed him some spectacular things, an earthquake, a fire, uh, what else? A strong wind. But the Bible says the voice of God is not in that. So it's not in all these spectacular things. And then a still, small voice came and Elijah heard it. So the voice of God is a still, small voice. It's a very faint voice that you oftentimes can miss if you don't tune yourself to that, right? But he wants to speak to you every day. Secondly, empowering. Now that is, so what time do I need to stop? I lost uh, 12. 12, Okay. The Holy Spirit and power. Now, this is where I want to bank the rest of my sermon. Today, okay, this is a pre, pre, uh, pre, not pre, it's a prelude to the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1, Jesus is about to take him up into heaven. And people ask, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Thinking of politics. Jesus said, it's not for you to know the time. But, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now, the word power is dunamis, where we have the word dynamite, right? It's, it's explosive power. And you'll be my witnesses. Now, the, a lot of churches, a lot of Christians who are charismatic or Pentecostal who have the Holy Spirit have missed the point. The point, now, in this instance, when the Holy Spirit came on the disciples, chapter 2 of the book of Acts talks about the day of Pentecost, they speak in other tongues. And that is one of the evidences when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. And it's a wonderful gift to have. Now, if you don't have, we would like to spend time to pray for you so that, so that you will experience that gift. Now, it's only a gift, right? You don't need that to get to heaven. <laughs> Some people say, oh, you don't have this, you don't get to heaven. No, you still get to heaven. A gift is, is an accessory to help you to grow. Anyway, so witnesses. So the whole point of giving this power is so that you become witnesses for God, to witness. Now, what is, what is a witness? So what does it mean to be a witness for Jesus? Well, in the court of law, in order to be a witness, how do you qualify? You have to have firsthand what you see or what you hear, right? You can say, oh, but the judge said, okay, tell us what happened. He said, according to my roommate, this is what happened. Well, that, that's not a valid witness, right? That, that's gossip, right? You, you hear from somebody else. So in order for you to be a valid witness, you have to experience yourself. So you want to be a witness for Jesus, you better experience him in a powerful way, right? So... Second Philippians 2.15 says, get out into the world uncorrupted. So go, right? We need to go. It's not, just, not meant to just stay. Once a week, we come together to worship. But we need to go out there to the highways and the byways. Matthew's uh, com- great commission, according to Matthew, is go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Mark's version is go into the other world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we are to go. As you go, do not allow the world to corrupt us. And a lot of times, we allow the world's philosophy and the way of life and everything to, to mess around with our lives. We become like, become very worldly. We become like the world. So in order to be, to be different, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. To be uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid. Squalid means filthy due to neglect, like, like downtown Seattle, right? You can tell it's so messy and filthy, polluted society. So God wants us to live differently, not like the world. Whatever they believe, whatever the philosophy, we should be different. A fresh, a, a fresh breath of air. 
So when people look into your life, they will say that, oh, you are different. The way you handle finances, the way you handle disappointments, you don't curse, you don't go for a drink, you know, but it's different. And you can even smile when you go through problems. What's up with you, right? Then we have a story to tell. Now, provide people with a glimpse of good living. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, what does that mean? You can tell people and say, there's a better life than what you're living right now. It's Jesus, right? I'm living the Jesus life, living a different life. A life that is different, providing a good living. When they look at your life, they say, oh, you are certainly different, right? People say, you know, after five years of marriage, you get bored and you have to have an affair or something. But for us, the older we get, the longer we get married, the more, the, the better it gets, right? You know why? Because with Jesus, the husband and the wife are both changing. So they are, we are discovering new things. If you are not in Christ, yeah, five years is really bored. Right? <laughs> there is nothing new to, new, to, to know anymore. But with Christ, we are changing, ever changing. So, so different life. Good and living carry the life-giving, light-giving message. You have a message to carry, but it's a light in the midst of darkness. Okay, the next one. Okay, now, Paul and Peter said, this is after when they received the Holy Spirit, they were very timid before they were hiding. And now, they say this in front of the, the, um, the priest, ask him not to talk anymore. He said, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So, first-hand experience, what Jesus has done in your life. You need to go out and tell your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, what Jesus has done in your life. Amen. Now, let me tell you my testimony. When I came to know Jesus at the age of 15, there was very little Bible study follow-up on my part. And I backslided because I, I received severe persecution, right? Because my, I came from a very uh, anti-Christian background. My grandfather, from my father's side, operated a temple. The temple is still around. So, so it's a great shame for us, for me, to become a Christian. And I became a Christian, and my mother finally couldn't tolerate anymore and said, okay, ultimatum. You want to live in this family? Forget about going to church. You want to go to church and live with your church. Let your church support you. You're not going to come back. And at the age of 15, I backslided simply because I didn't have a strong foundation. And then when I graduated from college, I went to a, uh, yeah, I finished my high school, I went to college. First day of school, a Christian approached me, and ever since they got hold of me, and I rededicated my life. And that was in September, or August, August in 1980, I still remember the year. I started coming back to church. And when I come to church, I realized like, oh, wow, the people... Assemblies of God Church, right? That's where I was born and I continue. And I hear people speaking and worshiping in a different language. And my heart will get very excited and said, I want that. I want that gift, but I don't know how. For six months, I waited. And then March 1981, I attended the first retreat. I received my baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was up in the rooftop. It was raining that, that night, but I couldn't, I didn't care, right? Then I was just on, so on fire. And before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was a Christian for six months, but a very timid one. I, I dare not reveal my identity. I was a secret, secret Christian, even in my family. This is the second time around. The first time around, I just backslided. The second time around. The second time around, I said, okay. Um, so I, I will try as much as possible to pretend that people don't know. And then when I sat in front of my non-Christian friends, I have to say grace, right? Then everybody would know. So I pretend, I put my hand like this, you know. Uh, so one day my friend says, what's wrong? Are you, are you having a headache? And I have to lie and say, yes, I, I, I'm not feeling well. Like, like, I have to lie in order to cover up. But ever since I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I came down from that mountain. I said, I don't care if I get kicked out of the family. This is it, right? And all of a sudden I begin to tell people, I'm a Christian. You don't like it, that's your problem, you know. I mean, all of a sudden I knew like, whoa, there is some kind of a courage that I have never known before. And that's the power, right? To become a witness that you do not become timid. Now, let me, let me transition in something else. I, this morning, I received this. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37, it's in the last day of the feast, He cried out and said, If anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Verse 38 says, and according to the scripture, 
that he who believes in me, out of his own inner being, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. And verse 39 says that he refers to the Holy Spirit. The question is that, is the river of life flowing from within you with vitality? Or it has been bottlenecked? Now, don't end up with the story that I read to you. Uh, Mother Teresa. All of us know Mother Teresa, right? Uh, and many of you were from the Catholic background. And she has been canonized as a, as, a, as a saint. It's not easy to get to be a saint. Isn't that true? Right? She's a saint. Now, this is what she wrote. In 2007, Time Magazine got hold of her personal memoirs. She wrote about herself, her faith. It's a shock to the whole world. Now, nobody, hands down, can, can match the sacrificial living that Mother Teresa, she gave her life to serve, right? In terms of service, she get A++++. But in terms of her faith, now this is what she said. She wrote to one of the bishop. Jesus has, been, has a very special love for you, he told the bishop. But as for me, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and I do not see. Listen, and I do not hear. And she said, I even doubted if God even exists. And I thought, what went wrong with this woman? She, she appears to be a giant of faith, serving God in such a way, but yet inside of her, she is empty. You could be that way too. You can come to church faithfully, you can serve, you can go through all the motions, but the river of life is not flowing in you. Then you will end up in Mother Teresa with a good record of serving God and faithful to God. Heart is empty. So today, the Holy Spirit wants to renew your faith. He wants to empower you to live a godly life. The next slide says, the power to overcome sin. Maybe you have some besetting sin. The power of God will help you to overcome. And you'll be a powerful witness when people look into your life. They said, I want what you have. I don't have. I don't have it all together. But you seem to have something that I want to have. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. So today, it's not about knowing this, but to experience the river of life once again to flow. So today, I want to invite you, I want to ask you a question. Do you want the Holy Spirit afresh? Being filled with the Spirit, being baptized with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit is all the same thing. To yield yourself with the Holy Spirit. All of you, I believe, how that you have known Jesus, have the Holy Spirit, right? Now that's not a trick question. All of you have the Holy Spirit. The question is, how much does the Holy Spirit have you? That's the king, right? When you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, the overflowing comes. On the other hand, when you grieve Him, you bottle Him up, you will feel miserable. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has nowhere to go because it's inside of you and you will feel the grief along with Him. That's, that's why when you obey God, you do things that are right. The joy, the joy of the Lord comes from the Holy Spirit. That's why you feel it. So it's up to you, right? If you, you want to continuously really live a rebellious life, to harden your heart, you will feel miserable because the Holy Spirit is being grieved. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit. But today, would you release the Holy Spirit in your life by saying, I yield myself. I give myself totally so that you will have permission to lead my life, to empower my life so that I'll be a powerful witness. Amen. If that's, let's all stand. Those of you who want a touch from the Holy Spirit so that the river once again will flow, just come forward here. We all want to pray for you, right? Uh, can you lead that song? Okay. How many of you want the Holy Spirit? Okay. It's for you. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. I know many of you. Just come a little uh, closer. That's right. Closer. So that there's more room. Hallelujah. That's right. Come on up. The invitation. Whosoever is thirsty, let him come and drink. And Jesus wants you to come to the river to drink. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's free for all. There's no shame, right? Just come. And he's going to touch you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's just sing this song. Holy. As you sing this song, just make it a prayer. They say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. Your prayer, that's right. Begin to open up your heart and say, Holy Spirit, come. I give you permission to lead me.
to empower me. I've tasted and, and seen the sweetness of your love. love. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you won't welcome here. Come fly. Let's just lift our hands toward heaven right now. Even those of you watching online, this is a holy, godly moment. God is in this meeting. God is moving in our midst. He's manifesting His presence. The Bible says, Blessed are those who are hungry, for they shall be filled. God wants to fill you. The question is, are you hungry for Him? Do you make space in your heart right now for His presence? Oh, I'm telling you, church, there's nothing this world could offer compared to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, when you taste it, the presence of God, is, it's not less filling. It's overflowing. Oh, God, if you are dry today, God offers refill. Amen. Let those dry hearts be refilled with the rivers. 
with the flowing of the presence of Jesus right now. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's just worship Him. Amen. Just worship Him. Let us become more aware of Your presence. Come on, let's become more God conscious. Not self conscious. Let us become Let us become more aware. more aware of your presence. Yes. Let, Let us experience the glory of your All this lift our hands toward heaven. Let us become, Let us become more, aware more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your presence. Yes. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive the fresh anointing today. Receive the fresh in feeling of the Spirit of God. The glory of your now just the people, Holy Spirit, make this our prayer. Holy Acts 1 8, as what Pastor Chris preached today. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Everybody say this to me I'm a witness. I'm a witness, I'm a witness for Jesus. Witness for Jesus. Where? In your home, that's your Jerusalem, in your marketplace, in your workplace, that's your Judea. Or in the outermost part of the earth, oh God, you should wherever you go. But today, I just want us to believe with me. Tell the person next to you, no more holding back. No more holding back. Come on, everybody say, no more fear. I am a witness. He did not tell you to be a judge, so don't judge. He did not ask you to be a lawyer. You don't need to defend Jesus. He can defend himself. But he needs a voice. God needs a voice. God needs a voice. Everybody say, God needs a voice. And that's all he's asking for you to do. You don't judge. You just say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. I was lost. I was now I'm found. I was addicted. I've been set free. Come on, somebody. Tell your story. Everybody say, I'm a witness. Right now, I'm going to pray right now. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, you said in your word, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, already over, uh, overflowing us, fear has to go. Cowardice has to go. We will have boldness and courage. If we are not ashamed to do sins before publicly, why not? be ashamed speaking Jesus publicly so God I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon our church called Charisma Christian Center to go out and be bold and speak the word in truth with love and and not judge people but be a witness for Jesus and I believe with all my heart not by might nor by power but by the Holy Spirit, we're going to change the atmosphere. We're going to change the city, oh God. We're going to change our family, oh God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said today, everybody say, come on, come on.